This video was made in collaboration with Hobby Academy. So I got a call earlier this week from one of my friends from college. And when you're a food scientist, people always have questions ready to text you, to ask you what's happening to their food. But my friend was saying earlier this week, her milk had curdled, which yeah, we've all been there, it sucks. But she was saying, you know, I wanted to ask you, why does it happen? Why does milk curdle? It's the fat, right? And I was like, what? It was like taking it back at first, but she, yeah, she's not a food scientist. I was like, the fat, the fat really is not doing much of anything. It's not the fat at all. Once I had more time to reflect on what my friend was saying, like that she thought it was the fat going bad, I totally understand what she was getting at because Fats, especially oils or something that is liquid at room temperature, these tend to oxidize or go bad really quickly and it results in really terrible off flavors like uh, cardboardy or painty, basically, uh, you know, things you don't really want to eat. But in the case of milk curdling, actually the component to blame is protein and let me explain why. To most people, milk might just be this white liquid, but to a food scientist, milk is much more complex than that. If we think on a microscopic level, we have a lot of different things. So most of the protein in milk is casein, and these casein proteins, they are actually in these really big aggregates called casein mycelles. We also have fat globules or like these little spheres of milk fat. Because milk comes from a farm, a, from an animal, it'd be very normal that there are some microorganisms in the product, although pasteurization will take care of the harmful microorganisms. And the surrounding liquid phase actually has a lot of different components dissolved in it. So this is where whey protein is. So whey protein, which is about 20% of the protein in milk, it is actually dissolved in the liquid. You also have things like lactose, um, different minerals, but you'll notice that for curdling, we really only have to pay attention to two components, and that's the bacteria and the casing. I need a break. What's on my phone? Instagram, I shouldn't. TikTok, just as bad. Oh, Hobby Academy, I can learn about so many topics all while gaming. This video, it's actually more than just a video. And that's because I'm collaborating with the gamified learning app called Hobby Academy so that you can learn the most from my work. With Hobby Academy, you can go beyond watching this video on milk curdling to playing fun mini games with the concepts and ideas I introduce here. I really believe it's easier to learn when you're having fun. And that's what Hobby Academy is all about. You can read dialogues, watch videos, and listen to articles about a bunch of interesting topics and then you play fun mini games about what you just learned. So with the Hobby Academy app, you're no longer limited to using your phone, you know, doom scrolling or binge watching a TV series. You can enjoy building knowledge and becoming smarter every day. Go find the link in the description of this video to get a cool promo, become my friend on the app, and let's get learning. Back to the video. So I think we got the components of milk down, but what the heck happens when milk curdles? You may have made the observation that curdling always seems to happen in older milk. And this is all due simply to a pH change or as that milk sat in your refrigerator for you know a couple days too long, the bacteria that are inside that milk that either you know when you opened it you contaminated the milk or maybe they were there uh, even after pasteurization because pasteurization is used to just uh, destroy the harmful bacteria it doesn't destroy all microorganisms anyways what happens is uh, the microorganisms in your milk they are eating the lactose or milk sugar they eat the lactose and they convert it to lactic acid and as more and more of this acid is produced the ph of your milk goes down it goes lower and lower over time until eventually it hits uh, what's called the isoelectric point 
Let's just take a moment to understand the isoelectric point because this is actually very important for understanding why milk curdles. So the isoelectric point, it just means that it's a specific pH where the protein has a net neutral charge. So for the casein in milk, which again is in these mice cells, these aggregates, under the normal pH of milk with fresh milk, these caseins, they actually all have a net negative charge. And this is very useful because it keeps the casein micelles away from one another, right? When they have the same negative charge, they sort of repel each other. So each casein micelle is very, very stable in that surrounding liquid. But as we lower the pH, or I should say not we, the bacteria in the milk make more of that lactic acid, they are lowering the pH. And as that happens, we approach the isoelectric point of casein, which means the casein micelles no longer have that negative charge. They now have a neutral charge. That's the whole definition of the isoelectric point. It's the pH at which the protein has a net neutral charge. So what actually happens as milk sits in your refrigerator for days and days, is you're giving time for the bacteria to produce more and more lactic acid, which as that's happening, we start approaching the isoelectric point of casein. And when this happens, the casein micelles begin to link up and aggregate with one another. And this happens so much that eventually we can see these aggregates as small particles. And this is what makes up those chunks or those visual uh, chunks when you see that milk has curdled. It's actually that casein protein. At the same time, you've given any microorganisms a lot of time to grow and reproduce. So they had enough time to really increase their numbers that you'll probably have a very high microbial load or microbial count. And these microorganisms can also make up bad smells, maybe uh, bad smells or flavors. But I will say the visual that, you know, the like chunky milk that we really find disgusting, that's actually the protein. What is kind of funny is that we use this curdling mechanism on purpose to make a lot of different foods. So for example, we use curdling to make tofu from soy milk, or if you've ever made homemade paneer, you use curdling to get the protein and you usually squeeze it, squeeze out some of the liquid to make something like tofu. Of course, with these foods, you don't like purposely use old milk, right? You don't wait till it has like very high bacterial loads and kind of smells. So it is curdling, but you don't wait for the milk to get old. Just to prove to you that it is indeed the casein protein, I can do a little at-home experiment to show you exactly what I just explained. Because nothing is special about lactic acid made from the bacteria. You can actually use any acid you have in your kitchen, be it lime juice, lemon juice, vinegar, and add this to some milk, to fresh milk, and we can make it curdle. Because remember, the only reason milk curdles to make those chunky chunks is because the increasing amount of acid in the liquid. So as I add this uh, lemon juice, I'm increasing the amount of acid, which means I'm lowering the pH. And if I can lower that pH until about the isoelectric point of casein, which I don't have a pH meter here, so I'm just kind of doing it slowly until I hopefully will see some chunks. If I continue to add more of that lemon juice and lower the pH, eventually I expect to start seeing those casein micelles aggregating with one, one another until I can see some of those protein chunks, which indeed you can see here. If you look at my spoon or the sides of the, the glass, you can start to see those visual chunks. So when it comes down to it, curdling is really these proteins misbehaving as the pH changes. But if you want to find a bright side, we actually use this same mechanism, this curdling, to make a lot of different foods from tofu to paneer.